Hey everyone, I'm Nick from Coffee Before Arch, and in this episode of Computer Organization and Design, we're going to be talking about eight great ideas in computer architecture. So the focus of this series is going to be going through the book, Computer Organization and Design, the Hardware Sof Software Interface, and specifically it's going to be the RISC-V edition. Uh, if you have, say, the edition that uses the MIPS instruction set, the content will be pretty much identical. Uh, the only difference will be uh, the instruction set used in examples. So. You know, in this series, we're going to get a basic idea of, you know, an introduction to computer architecture. Uh, so this will be things like, you know, how, how does a core actually work itself? Uh, what does a mem uh, memory system look like? And then, of course, you know, instruction set architectures and how we basically get from the high level software layer down all the way to, you know, the hardware uh, layer and how those two interact. So we're going to start out with um, eight great ideas in computer architecture. Now these are uh, by no means, you know, the only eight great ideas in computer architecture, but these are really the guiding principles that, you know, has driven computer architecture for the past 60 years or so. So as it says here, uh, you know, computer architecture has really only been around for 60 years. So when we think back to, you know, the first computers, this really was around, you know, late 40s, early 1950s with the first store program computers by Eckert and Mockley. Uh, and then of course there's the report from John von Neumann which really described the first store program computer. Uh, but it turns out that a lot of those ideas that were you know around back then in the 40s and 50s, you know they tended to you know stick around you know later on in successive generations and still exist in a large part to this day, uh, even if the technology has changed wildly. Uh, and then other ideas uh, that have they came around in the 60s and 70s, a lot of those have kind of stayed around uh, until now as well. So we're going to start out with talking about you know, the eight great ideas, the first of which being design for Moore's Law. So when we're talking about Moore's Law, we're referring to not an actual you know, physical law, but it was a trend that occurred that was first kind of coined by Gordon Moore, who was a, a founder at Intel, that basically said that you know the amount of you know, transistors per unit area that you'd have, you know, on a on an integrated circuit would double every 18 to 24 months. And this this was actually true for decades. It's only in the past, you know, and since around 2006 or so, that this has started to, you know, gradually decrease um, as transistor scaling slows down. Uh, however, we're still making bigger and bigger chips, so we still have uh, lots of transistors to work with. Um, now, the reason why that this is so important, designing for Moore's Law, it's basically saying that because of how fast technology moves, we can't plan for the technology. We don't we don't want to plan for the te with the technology that we have today. We want to plan for the technology that we're going to have tomorrow or in this case, you know, a year from now or two years from now. It takes quite a while to come up with, you know, a new architecture, but we have to kind of try to predict, you know, what resources will I have by the time that we're actually re uh, ready to, you know, come out with this new product line. And so, you know, we want to make sure that we're we're using the resources that we have available to us um, on each chip, especially if it can do as much as they double uh, between, you know, generations. Now, the next great idea is uh, the use of abstraction, right? So this may seem fairly obvious, but um, it's 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 an incredibly important, important part of uh, most uh, design. Uh, so we don't want everyone to have to be, you know, an expert on every single field. That's just not very reasonable. So what we'd like to do is, you know, hide some load level details um, between each different layer uh, of, you know, research or each different layer of development and just prevent, you know, a nice interface that, you know, uh, the layer above or the layer below uh, can look at. So you know, an example of this is say someone that writes, you know, application software. So if you're writing your application software, you don't want to have to be thinking about, well, you know, what are the device physics of the transistors? Uh, that's just not something that's very reasonable. And likewise, if you're if you're actually one of those people doing devices and worrying about, you know, at the, you know the transistor level and the implementation level of, you know, how are you actually going to you know, fabricate a chip? You don't want to have to be an expert on, well, what is the software that people are going to be writing? Uh, so we use abstraction to simplify this. So, you know, and we use different levels of abstraction, right? So, you know, it's not just, you know, directly here's applications and here is, 
uh, you know, devices, we've got a lot of layers in between. So we've got, you know, applications and then we'll have system software. So that'll be, you know, what interface do we provide to applications? And then how do we talk with the hardware? Then you'll have architecture, which blends that even more going down to the more devices side of, okay, how does the architecture actually map down to, you know, physical, um, physical devices, uh, and likewise, what architecture is presented to something like an operating system. So, you know, with all of the different layers, we have abstractions. So we'll present a certain abstraction to the applications, we'll present a certain abstraction to the operating system, and we'll continue this all the way down. So this is a really key idea. Now, uh, one of the very important ones is also making the common case fast. A lot of times this is referred to um, as Amdahl's law. And so this really comes down to when we're coming up with a design or coming up with a new architecture, we want to focus on making the common case fast. So if we have, you know, something that's, you know, maybe, you know, here's our entire execution time. And maybe we do some very special function that takes up a very small portion of execution time. Let's say maybe this is multiplication. And then we've got a huge part of execution time that's dominated just by, say, addition. Now, if we say, okay, so over the entire execution time, we only do a little bit of multiplication, but maybe I'm really, really clever and I come up with some great idea, and maybe I can improve the speed of multiplication infinitely, so it takes zero time now. Well, even though I improved, you know, the total, now, multi now multiplication takes zero time, the effect is that total execution time, you know, it, it only decreases by a little bit. Right, so you know, I may spend a lot of effort getting infinite amounts of speed up uh, on a small section of the program, but at the end of the day, it's still a small section of the program. Now, let's take into consideration, you know, the addition part. Now, this is a little unrealistic because we have adders that are very fast now that only take, you know, a cycle or so. But let's say we're able to speed up addition 50%, right? So we're able to cut execution, uh, we're able to cut this execution time. Uh, in half, right? So by even just an increase of, you know, if addition goes twice as fast, so we cut out 50% of the execution time, we actually improve performance by far more than infinitely increasing the speed of multiplication because of how much of the overall execution time uh, that multiplication actually takes up. And so you know, where does this lead us? Well, it's important that we don't get that even if we have something that's a great idea that we think, you know, oh, infinite speed up on some, you know, some problem, you know, maybe that's not really a major problem in reality, right? So maybe, uh, maybe, you know, infinite speed up in one area isn't a good allocation of our resources. Maybe we should be focusing on, you know, even a moderate speed up to something that's done far more frequently, and that will give us a far better result. Um, so this, of course, isn't just like with Moore's Law, it's not a hard and fast rule. There's always going to be exceptions. Maybe, you know, the speed up you get on the large portion of execution time really is kind of small. And maybe the, you know, infinite speed up is really, really easy. So, of course, there's going to be exceptions. But a lot of times we focus on making the common case fast. Uh, so the next idea uh, is this idea of performance uh, via parallelism. So a lot of things that modern uh, computer architecture does for performance relies on doing things in parallel. So we don't want things to be single threaded and require, you know, you know, asynchronous or re requiring synchronous communication. So we don't, we don't want to have, you know, started instruction and I have to wait for that instruction to complete before I can do anything else. And likewise, I don't want to have to wait for a request to the memory system before doing anything else. So I want to be able to do things in parallel. Uh, so this comes in a lot of layers. So there's things like instruction level parallelism. So like we kind of mentioned, we want to have multiple instructions in flight at the same time. Um, also, we want to have a data level parallelism. So if I've got something like uh, vector addition, where I want to, ha where I have a vector of elements, you know, one, two, uh, two, three, four, five, dot, 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 and I want to add that to another vector of elements, you know six, seven, eight, nine, dot, dot, dot. You know, all of these operations can occur in parallel because there's no dependency between 
this calculation and this calculation and this calculation. So if I map this to something like a GPU, I can have just a whole bunch of threads do all of this in parallel. Uh, so this is more data level parallelism. Uh, and likewise, I can have task level parallelism. So if I have just two completely applications running at the same time, uh, they, I can just schedule them to say different cores, right? So I can have multiple applications running on different cores, uh, all occurring in parallel. So, you know, all of these things are how we make or, or how we really improve performance, especially now that it's really, really hard to squeeze out a single threaded performance. Um, that's becoming increasingly difficult because of things like the end of frequency scaling and the fact that transistors aren't getting much smaller. So, you know, as we're talking about instruction level parallelism, the idea of pipelining is very important and uh, it's important enough to kind of merit its own uh, section in this idea of great ideas. So we can think about pipelining or instruction level parallelism is this idea of having multiple instructions in flight at the same time. So as more a, you know, a non-tech example that they kind of give here is let's say that, you know, it's a, you know, pre fire engine days and there's a fire and you want to put it out. Well, you don't want to have someone running back and forth uh, to say the well to fill up a bucket and toss it in the fire. So instead you make a line of people and the line of people passes multiple buckets to the well and then you've got multiple buckets filled with water coming back at the same time. Uh, so this is the exact same or this is you know very similar to how pipelining works. So with pipelining we'll begin multiple instructions at the same time and they'll all be at a different part of execution. Some will be near the end of execution writing back their results. Some will be at the beginning of execution just you know fetching their instructions. Uh, but the nice thing is, is that they're all, they're using up all the resources that we have on chip at the same time so that, you know, instead of just one person having to run back and forth, you know, we've got all the people kind of involved in, you know, making things go faster. Uh, another, you know, key idea is the idea that we don't have to exactly know uh, everything, uh, everything ahead of time in order to begin execution. So it turns out that we can be pretty good at prediction. And you know the key idea here is that we need prediction to be um, a good enough so we're not mispredicting very often, and we also need a way to recover from misprediction and make sure that that recovery is not too expensive that it just becomes too prohibitive to actually do. So uh, a key example of this is branch prediction. So if we have something like uh, you know, if you remember from a high-level programming language. You know, there's the idea of control flow. So you have an if statement, an else statement, uh, maybe you have a for loop, uh, something like that, or even nested control flow. So, you know, let's take the example of a for loop that's going to uh, go over, you know, 10 iterations. Now, you know, kind of naively, just looking at a for loop, we can say, well, most of the time we're actually going to, you know, jump back to the top of the for loop and we're going to continue doing the for loop. Um, uh, quite quite a few times, especially if that you know the number of iterations gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So say it's a hundred iterations, a thousand iterations, ten thousand iterations. So you know as that goes up, you know it turns out that prediction in in the in that case can be really easy. So if we just predict rather naively, okay, we'll just predict that the for loop, you know, we will jump to the top of the for loop every single time. Well, the only two times we're going to make a mistake. Um, or the only time we're going to make a mistake is at the very end of execution. So at the very last iteration where we actually don't want to jump to the top of the for loop, that's the only time that, you know, we're going to mispredict. So in that case, it's actually pretty easy. And modern branch predictors do a really good job. and can get upwards of 95% accuracy. It's a little bit harder for things like unconditional uh, branches um, or jumps, but you know, even still we can do a decent job, um, especially if we're going over the same parts of, pro of programs again and again. So, you know, this idea of prediction, you know, is, is really key to a lot of things because that means that we don't have to wait, you know, when we're talking about, you know, a for loop. So every iteration, we're actually doing a comparison. We're making sure that we're within some boundary condition. Now, uh, if we can just bypass that, you know, that check, um, of saying, you know, it, are we going to make this boundary condition and automatically start, you know, fetching instructions from the path that says, you know, we're going to continue doing this for loop, then, 
you know, we don't have to wait for that boundary condition to be evaluated before we can start fetching new instructions. So that's really the key idea with prediction. So uh, the next thing is this idea of a hierarchy of memories. So of course, you know, the, the main, the goal that we'd all like to have that's unattainable is having fast, large, and cheap uh, pieces of memory. Uh, now this just really isn't feasible. You know, if you want something to be fast, a lot of times it's going to be expensive. A lot of times if we want something to be large, right, it's not going to be cheap. Um, and various combinations of these. So something that's fast and large will be cheap. Something that's large and cheap, a lot of times will be fast, etc. So it turns out we can play some games and we can have a hierarchy of differently sized and uh, different technology memories that allow us to give us kind of the illusion that we, uh, that we have, you know, an infinitely large, uh, you know, and fast piece of memory. And so it turns out if we design these well and we make sure that, you know, in the smaller, you know, pieces of memory that are very close to the core, we make sure that we get a lot of locality and we're, uh, we're constantly hitting and accessing things in those small, very fast pieces of memory. Uh, but we still have larger pieces of memory kind of going down that are kind of our safety nets. You know, we can really, you know, limit the cost of saying having to go to some giant piece of memory or, you know, hopefully not having to go to disk to fetch something. So a lot of times, you know, likewise with here, so we, we generally represent this as a triangle. So you'll have, you know, some technology at the very top, you know, in your L1 cache, maybe that'll be, you know, very fast SRAM. Now SRAM is made out of, you know, it can be made out of, I believe six transistors that are cross coupled inverters. Now, so this is already going to be six inverter or six transistors. Uh, but the thing is, it's very fast. Um, so moving down, you know, a little cheaper and more dense, so you can make it very large very easily, is DRAM. It doesn't take up much space. Uh, but the thing is, with DRAM, DRAM is a lot slower than SRAM, and so there's a there's a trade-off here. Um, it's slower than SRAM, but it's also a lot more dense because DRAM only takes you know, one transistor. And then likewise, if you go down here another level, you've got disk. Now disk is going to be way slower than DRAM or SRAM, but the thing is you can get a huge capacity there. So it's all trade-offs uh, as we go down the levels. And what we'd like to do is make sure, you know, we're really trying to stay in these upper levels, but we've got these lower levels just in case. And the final um, really great idea that, you know, at least as far as the eight kind of guiding principle ideas is that, uh, we want to design for dependability and redundancy. So, so far we've mainly talked about how do we make things go fast, um, you know, either through prediction or having a hierarchy of memories to handle the fact that we can't have extremely large, um, fast things, uh, things like pipelining and parallelism, using abstraction as far as a means for design. Uh, but a very key thing is this idea of dependability and redundancy. So. It, it's really you know no use to us if you know if a problem occurs and either a you know we can't detect that it occurs or b if a problem occurs we lose everything this is just not a realistic way to work so we want to make systems dependable and include redundant components so that if a failure occurs uh, we can a maybe recover from that failure and if we can't recover from that failure we need to be able to know uh, what failure occurred or where a failure uh, occurred. So um, this is another key part, um, especially as we make things, uh, as we make you know devices smaller and smaller, because we get all kinds of you know kind of crazy quantum effects, um, and you know all all kinds of effects that may not have occurred at you know larger technology nodes. Uh, we need to be able to you know detect whenever these uh, issues happen. And so you know there's even uh, there's even crazy things where you can have, um, I believe it's, you can have a, uh, you can have an alpha particle actually hit a transistor and it can cause a bit to flip. And this is something that, you know, you, you can't, you can't predict, you can't, you can't actually account for. And so you have to be able to handle, you know, what if this happens? What if it happens in memory, right? So in memory, we all send a bit flips. How do I detect if a bit flips? And we've got a number of ways we can handle that through error correcting codes, etc. But yeah, these were going to be the eight kind of great ideas in computer architecture that really guide a lot of our uh, design in the future uh, and have guided it in the past. Now, next time we're going to 
you know, start by talking about what's below your program. So we generally, so this, this is a big part of abstraction, but we want to know how do we go from application software and then get all the way down to something that's going to execute um, in hardware. Uh, but that's going to go ahead and do it for this video. So feel free to check out all of my other series on, uh, on YouTube or yeah, if you're interested in any of the programming series that I have on YouTube, I host all the code on github.com slash coffee before arch. So here we've got C++ programming stuff, GPU programming with CUDA, uh, parallel programming in C++. And so in here, there's links to all the different videos on the left, uh, the files on the right. So here's some GPU programming stuff. So we'll just go ahead and open up, say, tile matrix multiplication. So feel free to download any of these and play around with them. As always, I'm Nick from Coffee Before Arch, and I hope you have a nice day.